So we proceed to the next speaker, and actually we are slightly changing topics. It's now we are going to consider more societal aspects of vaccination, and Angus Thompson will start. So Angus is a head vaccination confidence and coverage in global public affairs at Sanofi Pasteur in Lyon here. He's also adjunct assistant professor in the Hubert Department of Global Health. Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, is uh, uh, also adjunct clinical professor at the Department of Communication Studies and Global Health Communication Center at the Indiana University School of Liberal Arts at IUPUI. Is it correct? Um, so uh, Angus Thompson, Thompson works with vaccine communication and has developed a global program of research, development, and implementation into adherence to vaccination and public engagement. And as you know, this is uh, quite an issue worldwide, and particularly in France, as I will discuss. After. So please. Thank you, Professor Fisher. So how are you doing? It's been a long day. Have you guys been here all, all day? As Professor Fisher said, I want to change gears a bit. Um, I mean, in fact, I, I started my work as a, as a research scientist many years ago, um, but we're moving a long way away from viruses and, and bacteria and, and other microorganisms. We're moving to the most complex uh, thing in the universe, people. And trust me, it's easier to work with viruses than to work with people. <laughs> so my title today is Sustaining Trust in Vaccination in a Post-Fact World. I've tried to, I've been looking at this subject for seven or eight years now, but I've tried to really update my presentation to make it um, uh, relevant to our current times. The current times where we find ourselves posing this question on the front cover of time. Is truth dead? <coughs> what do these words have in common? They're banned. They're banned. <laughs> They're banned. They're not exactly banned when we dug into it. There was a recommendation within the CDC to maybe avoid using these words in their grant applications. <laughs> but this is still pretty serious, right? We've got fact-based, evidence-based. Is the microphone working? Yeah. Is it skipping in and out? It's okay? <laughs> Where is this coming from? I use social media not because I like to, but because it's the only way to fight a very dishonest and unfair press. Now often referred to as fake news media. So what? What does this have to do with vaccination? It has a lot to do with vaccination. Because the same current President of the United States, this is one of his tweets, he had over 40 tweets around vaccines and autism. 40 tweets that he put out there. So what? Well, very soon after his election, we had the renowned Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who um, owns this brilliant quote, they get the shot, that night they have a fever of 103, they go to sleep, and three months later, their brain is gone. Now, I, looked, I went looking for the medical term for dis dis disappearance of brain. I couldn't find one. <laughs> this does matter. It matters because Kennedy then went out emboldened by this new president and his comfort, his, his, uh, his, his reveling in a post-fact world, he went out emboldened and announced that he was going to lead a commission of inquiry into the safety of vaccines. This is serious. I'm going to come back to this one later. I just, before we slip down the rabbit hole here, I just thought I'd give you a little beacon so that you can hold on to that, okay? Let's just remember, okay? They work. Vaccines work. Okay? They're saving, they're saving five lives every minute, probably a lot more than that, okay? There's no more smallpox on the planet. There's, there's what, 16 million people walking because they didn't get paralytic poliomyelitis since the, since the implementation of the global eradication campaign. Okay, so that's our little beacon as we, as we wind our way down the rabbit hole. But if I leave you with one thesis today, it is that in a post-fact world, when we want to understand 
what is driving people's decisions around vaccination, we must be evidence-based. We must be science-based. Maybe we don't put that in our grants if we're in the US, but we have to base what we do on science. And this field, when I arrived in it eight, nine years ago, was, was riddled with assumptions and ideas. Assumptions and ideas from people who were trained scientists, applying scientific method to the development of vaccines, to the implementation of vaccination programs, and then they're turning around and talking about vaccine hesitancy based on the ideas they had. So let's ask the questions and let's try and answer the questions with science. Does fake news lead to vaccine hesitancy? And the bigger question, does vaccine hesitancy lead to under vaccination? Because that's what matters. What matters is, are vaccination programs sustaining levels of coverage that allow us to protect populations, allow us to protect the fragile and the vulnerable in those populations? A study by a colleague, Brendan Nye, a political scientist in the US who's done some great work on um, people's, uh, uh, the, the impact of the messages um, that have been used to communicate vaccination by the CDC, but I, I won't go on that today. A study that was just published, they put this out themselves, they didn't even go through a journal, but he is a very rigorous scientist. They looked at fake news during the election. They had a sample size of over 2,500 people, and they tracked those people's reading habits, online reading habits. They could also tell from their reading habits whether they were Republican or Democrat, however you want to put things. And their, their findings are interesting. They don't answer the first question, but they start to show us how we can understand this problem. Okay? Um, people reading fake news were heavily concentrated in small groups, and these were the groups that were the most politically polarised. Only 1-6% to 6 of their diet of news was fake news. 1% in Democrats, about 6% in Republicans, or Trump supporters. Facebook was the main vector, and the fact checks that were being done never reached these people. This doesn't answer our first question, but it shows you that instead of us just throwing up our arms and saying, oh my God, fake news is, is leading to under vaccination, we can do the science and we can ask the questions, we can answer the questions with science, and those answers help us to shape our responses, help us to shape how we communicate vaccination to the public, to the healthcare profession, to, to, to the world. So, does loss of confidence lead to loss of coverage? It's an obvious, the answer is yes. But when you really look out there, there, are, there, are, there is evidence to show that this has occurred a number of times, but not dozens and dozens of times, primarily probably because we haven't, looked, we haven't generated the evidence. This is an example that I like to use. This is, um, this is the UK, um, starting in 1996. This is coverage rates for MMR vaccination, starting around 78%, going up to 95% there. And this is number of measles cases, the publication of Wakefield's um, paper. Coverage went down, measles cases went up. We have a few examples like this, but it's hard to show because we don't always have the data to show it. Does this, did this, have an impact beyond the initial impact in the UK? Yes, we know that, okay? This is last year. These are measles outbreaks across Europe last year. We had 37 children who died in Romania this last year because they caught measles, a perfectly preventable disease. So yes, this is a serious public health issue, but it's a public health issue that has to be addressed through science, the way that we address every other piece of vaccination, of the vaccination universe. <coughs> so, that said, I'm going to give you a few key understandings that we have come to through the evidence. The first one is, this has been around ever since Jenner was inoculating people from cowpox blisters. In addition, it can touch any program anywhere in the world. This is not a first world problem. This is not a problem with certain vaccines. We had a problem with tetanus in Kenya. Tetanus. So it's not a question of vaccines that perhaps have lower efficacy. Okay? It can touch any vaccination program anywhere in the world. <coughs> Secondly, it's an obvious one, but it's true. Vaccines are a victim of their own success. There's some nice science here in this graphic as well. <coughs> I know. Oh, we clicked. 
football. It looks better the other way, I'm sorry. This is starting in 1945. The circles indicate the number of cases for diphtheria, polio, pertussis, measles, chickenpox, etc. The orange circle is when vaccination started. We see after each orange circle as we go in time, the number of cases descend. This is a beautiful way of showing the impact of vaccines. There are no numbers here. There are big circles and little circles. This is how the world, this is how we all understand numbers. This is how we understand risk. So this is a lovely infographic because it communicates information through graphics. It doesn't just put numbers uh, in, a, in a lovely font or in, a, in, a, in, a, in bold. So when I started, the starting point about eight years ago um, was based on um, the science coming out of behavioral economics, the work from Kahneman and Sversky and some of the other cognitive psychologists who um, who, who, who extended their work <clears throat> and that work was starting to tell us very clearly that although we love to be, think of ourselves as very rational beings uh, we're not that rational in many of our decisions in fact we're quite irrational in many of our decisions and with apologies to the cognitive uh, psychologist Dan Aureli we're predictably irrational the science of cognitive social psychology, the science of social psychology, can help us predict those irrationalities that we have, those cognitive biases, those mental shortcuts. And this was very interesting. And when we started to, when I started to look at the cognitive shortcuts that were out there, there seemed to be a number that could explain what was going on when people were hesitant or maybe even refusing vaccination. Social norms. We will do what we think people and other people are doing or what they expect us to do. This is a very powerful driver of our behaviour. We see causation in coincidence. You can see how that would apply to vaccination. We prefer anecdotes and stories to data and evidence. This is how we have understood our world for 500,000 years. Science is, is, is just a drop in human history. This, this period of us understanding our world through data and evidence is very, very new. And it still really takes a scientific education to start to believe the data, or at least in my experience. And we see what we believe rather than believing what we see. This is um, motivated reasoning, or sometimes called confirmation bias, not quite correctly. We have our position. And we seek out the evidence that confirms our position. And we tend to have a bit of a blind spot when there's stuff that, that contradicts what we think is right. And a very nice study by um, a political scientist in the US showed that scientists are even better at finding the evidence that supports our personal positions. But I won't go into that today. I don't have time. So I thought, OK, this is where we're up to. It's cognitive biases. We need to figure out these cognitive biases and how to communicate them. But when I first started this, I, I, I started going to judgment and decision making conferences, cognitive psychology conferences, to understand what, are the what is the science that they use, what are the, how do they ask the questions, how do they answer the questions. And at one of those conferences, there was a presentation on vaccination. And a, a, a woman stood up, a researcher stood up, and she said, well, that's all very nice, but you're talking about vaccination and I don't vaccinate and none of my friends vaccinate. So I don't see the relevance of your presentation. <laughs> and so afterwards I, I sought her out in the poster session and tried to engage with her, to talk with her, just chatting generally. And our conversation was extraordinary because this was a woman who had a single mother, a Russian single mother, uh, living in Italy who had a child uh, with autism, and she was trying to understand this complex, idiopathic condition, very difficult to manage. And so we discussed this a little bit, and I said, I can't imagine how it would be, I'm a parent as well, etc., etc. And throughout the conference, she sought me out. She came back to talk more and more and more about vaccination and about other things. And it was at that point that I realized that very often for people, this is not a question of MMR. This is a question of autism. And we were getting it all wrong. 
because we were hammering on to people about how the MMR vaccine is safe. And that was not what people needed to hear. They needed to, to hear what it is like to manage a child with autism now. Life with a child with autism. Where has this come from? How do I manage this? Where are we going? And vaccination was just a, a handle on that complexity for them. And so that led me to realize that there are fundamental root causes behind many of the reasons that we're hearing from people that are underlying people's decisions to vaccinate, their hesitancy or their refusal to vaccinate. Idiopathic diseases like autism. Where has this come from? It manifests it contemporaneously with vaccination. That makes sense. I have an explanation. Why wouldn't you start to believe that? Too much too soon. All those vaccines going into that little baby, that developing immune system. I mean, we know that that little developing immune system is going flat out 100 miles an hour, but, you know, with hundreds of thousands of immunologic <laughs> shocks every minute. But that makes sense, too many too soon. This makes sense to someone who's, who's trying to keep their baby safe. Toxins. I lead a pure lifestyle. I, I eat natural uh, organic food, etc. There you can, you can start to see that this is potentially coming not from someone's concern about aluminium in a vaccine, but from their fundamental worldview, the way they see the world, their values, their beliefs. And a uh, rather topical one being in France, conspiracies. I don't know if anyone saw the study that was recently done. I haven't actually read it, so I'm, I'm quoting the numbers in the press, but I haven't gone to the study. I'm not sure how rigorous it was, but it seems that um, um, <laughs> I think it's 70 to 80 percent. 70 percent of, of people in France believe in at least one conspiracy theory. And uh, those of you who are French here, at least half of you believe that I, as, a, as an employee of Sanofi Pasteur, are in cahoots with the French Ministry of Health to hide things about vaccines. Conspiracy theories. We understand conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories satisfy feelings of powerlessness, of disillusion. They help us to get a handle on complexity. And let's face it, we live in a complex world. So again, we can start to understand why people might believe in these conspiracy theories. And our role, our role, is to understand what is driving people's decisions and to help them understand that vaccination is an important act for them, for their, for their family, for their entourage, and, and for their communities. Our role is not to judge them. Our role is not to laugh, it's not to snort. So, this decision-making process around vaccination is a complex mosaic. In each person, it is determined by their values, their beliefs, their worldview, uh, the historical context, uh, the political context, <coughs> their attitudes, the social norms of where they live, the culture. This is not good news because we're dealing with a very complex problem. But if we want to get this right, we have to embrace this complexity. So, truth is dead, long live truthiness. Has anyone heard the word truthiness? Originally coined by um, Stephen Colbert. What did he, how did he say it? Truthiness is the truth that I feel in my gut. <laughs> Not the truth that comes from facts. It was actually word of the year by, uh, by uh, one, of the, one of the dictionary companies uh, a number of years ago. But it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So what? So what if people are believing truth or if they're believing truthiness? It doesn't matter. What we have to do is adapt our communications, our engagement with people, so that we are speaking to their truth or their truthiness. With truth, or maybe with a bit of truthiness, I'm not sure yet. There we go. Now an informal truth that comes from the gut, not facts. What, what does the data tell us? We hear, actually I'm going to go back to conspiracy theories. 
when I started this when I started this work, and I still hear it today, people who work every day in vaccination, who are trained scientists, talk to me about the anti-vaccination lobby. The anti-vaccination lobby. I'm waiting for someone to show me the anti-vaccination lobby. It doesn't exist. Okay, this is like talking about the Illuminati, or or, or that Elvis is still alive and. And, and well in Australia, which he is actually, we're taking good care of him. Okay? We know that in all the studies, all the data shows us at least where the studies have been done, 1-2% to 2 maximum in a population of people refuse all vaccination. And vaccination is the social norm, at least for childhood immunisation, in almost every program. Okay? 55 to 75%. It's a norm, people just do it. It's also a norm in terms of attitudes to vaccination in adults but we don't get the coverage rates that we should be getting in childhood immunisation because the programs are not performing well enough. Okay. It's these people, these hesitants, that we need to engage with. I'm going to spend the last five minutes giving you a few ideas of how we engage with them, but I just want to leave you with one other story. I was talking to a friend, a friend of a friend, the cousin of a friend, um, about vaccines. People in France love to talk about vaccines at the moment, and. I have to talk to them about it because that's my job, <laughs> even though I'd rather just be having a beer. And I answered a series of questions as best as I could, and then she said, you know what? Thanks for answering the questions, because it's hard to ask the questions. Because when I ask questions, I'm stigmatised. People call me anti-vaccine, and I'm not anti-vaccine. I just have questions. You know what? She's not anti-vaccine, she just have que has questions. I have questions about vaccines. This is normal to have questions. We have to embrace this and think about how we can answer those questions for people so that they are reassured, so that their trust is sustained. We always need to see hesitancy in the context of the other reasons why we might get to under vaccination. I'm going to have to move fast now. These are the five A's taxonomy. Um, I can share these slides afterwards. We've published this. But we must also always ask the question, are we sure it's hesitancy that's causing the problem? So there's no magic bullet for this. There are really no proven strategies to date. That's partly because we haven't tested what's out there. It's also partly because what we've been doing just hasn't been working. It hasn't been working because we've been chucking information over the fence, as I like to put it. The information deficit <coughs> model. Okay? There is this no-do gap. People know what they should do, but they don't do it. We need to understand what it takes to get people from knowing to doing. There are two things we know. Everything's about trust. Trust in vaccines, trust in those who make the vaccines, trust in those who provide the vaccines, whether that's the, the healthcare system, whether that's um, the Ministry of Health, and so on. It's all about trust, so every conversation you have around vaccination, you must sustain trust. The second thing is, the recommendation from a healthcare professional is the most powerful predictor, social psychological predictor of whether someone will get vaccinated. In France, where we have even higher levels of hesitancy perhaps, it is an even stronger predictor in the data that we have. So, I have a few actions that I want to put out there, but I'm going to have to move fairly quickly because I've only got five minutes. These are things you can do, okay? And there may be things that you should do. <laughs> First of all, what's the conversation? Set up a Google alert, start listening. Know what's going on in your region. Each of you are responsible for understanding what's going on so that when people ask you questions, you can answer them. Each of you are responsible for engaging with people the same way that I've just spoken to you about on the questions they have. If each of you touch five people in the next month and they touch another five people and you get your colleagues to do the same thing, we'll have an impact. As long as you're quiet, the dial's not going to move. You're all responsible. Set up a Google Alert. Next time someone talks to you about va vaccines, Shut up and listen to them. Try to understand where they're coming from, and then try to reply to them in a way that might help them understand the response, okay? And I can assure you that science, facts, references won't help you very much. They're part of it, but they're not the whole thing. At the end of that conversation, you must have increased their trust in you as someone talking about vaccines, and hopefully their trust in vaccines. That's your objective. Your objective is not to get them to go out to vaccinate. Um, there are, every country needs a source of information. Where do people go when they ask questions? Make it good, make it resonant. 
Put the material in, people, in, the, in the form that people like. Videos, interviews, infographics, animations. Make a comment. You can comment in newspapers. Make a comment. This is starting to happen in countries. I see this in Australia. I see this in the US. The negative comments that everybody's been throwing their hands up about for an article on vaccination that inevitably arrive are increasingly being diluted by positive comments. You're all responsible for that dilution if you believe <coughs> that vaccination is an important public health act, an important medical act. <coughs> Convene diverse voices, coalitions, bring different voices to the conversation. Civil society organisations, medical societies, parent groups, scientific organisations. How many people in here have a biochemistry, microbiology, molecular biology degree? You know vaccines work. <laughs> you know how they work. Immunology, you know how they work. Okay? Talk about it. Get out there. You're responsible. You're responsible for helping people understand those who don't have your scientific training. Understand how vaccines work. That they work. That they play an important role. That they are a pillar of our health systems around the world. Here's an example of how that works. On January 10th, as I noted, emboldened by Trump, Kennedy stated that he was going to lead this uh, Commission on Vaccine Safety. In less than a month, on Trump's desk, was a letter led by the AAP, the American Association of Pediatrics, signed by 350 organisations explaining to him why vaccination programs are vital to the health of America. That is massive mobilisation. And that is mobilisation that could only have happened if they were ready to mobilise. Is France ready to do that? Is the UK ready to do that? Is Australia ready to do that? It's important because this kind of preparedness needs to be put in place. I'm going to skip over these because I don't have time. I'm going to give you two examples of how you can also just flip things. As I've, I've been saying, use science but don't use science. Well, how can you do that? Well, flip it. Make it funny. This is the most successful uh, campaign for vaccination in, in the US. Um, this was done by Shot at Life. Um, you see Vaccinate Your Family. They had big billboards around. It's cool. It's funny. It's cute. But you also get the message, right? I also quite like flipping things. This is a pretty cool t-shirt. Vaccines cause adults. So I want to finish here with another Kennedy. This time John F. Kennedy. <coughs> Sorry, bro. The great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, pervasive and unrealistic. Belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. But so what? Okay? We can't snort and imagine that we have we we live with the discomfort of thought and that people live with the comfort of myths. Okay? We need to help people understand what's a myth, what's fact, and which facts are gonna have an important impact on their lives, on the lives of their families, of their communities. So we need to reach that balance between the truth and truthiness in a way that will eventually help people to understand that vaccination is an important act for them, for their families and for their community. We need to engage with those hesitant people. We need to understand what's motivating them. We only do that through listening. And you all need to get into the conversation. That's my call to action today. You all have a responsibility. I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, Nathan Mugan and Christina Klau, um, who's not here with us. Professor Parrish Sproul, um, I didn't get a chance to talk about the work we're doing on um, uh, the conversation in the clinic conversation between healthcare professionals and people and their patients. And all the other researchers that I, I have contact with through our global community of practice that we've developed through, through meetings here in France over the last seven or eight years. Um, there's a bit of further reading there, you'll find those videos online. Um, I think I talk better here than on the, on the camera there. And the publication there that we have that's open access it kind of covers those action points. What can a, what can a country put in place? 
and specifically what should healthcare professionals be thinking about when they're discussing vaccination with their patients. Thank you.